everyone. Um, you know, last week we went through a message, um, the letter to Philemon, right? Um, and it was a letter um, talking about the reconciliation between two people and how that's important for us to look at as well because um, it's a personal application of the gospel. They saw the reconciliation between, you know, um, you know, between these two individuals, but that reflects on us between how Christ took our cost, our price, so we can be reconciled to the Father. Um, and and Pastor Dave pointed out to me, you know, last week, you know, sometimes I pronounce things wrong, like uh, Philemon. Usually I'd pronounce it Philemon, um, but last week I, I corrected myself and I would say Philemon. Um, but last week I kept saying Onesimus, right? Um, it's actually Onesimus. <laughs> So I want you guys to be informed. That is the correct pronunciation. It's, okay, it's not one's a miss. It's okay. Bro. Even though it's good to have oneness, right? Like one's a miss. Uh, but onesimus. Okay. I just had to correct that. <laughs> um, today, um, we're actually looking at the final letter that Paul writes while he's in prison. So this is the last letter um, of his prison epistles, as they're known. Um, and it's the letter to the Church of Philippi, or the Philippian Church. Um, and this, this New Testament letter, it's kind of known... Out of the New Testament, it's the letter of joy. And for many of you that have read it, you probably kind of, um, kind of received that kind of answer from it as well. It's a letter of joy because uh, for many people, uh, they see this, it's a letter of having joy, having contentment throughout hardship. And for a lot of people, this is actually one of their favorite books of the Bible uh, because you know, joy is something that we're all seeking, right? We all desire to have that. But before looking at the letter, um, I want us to look at just how the church began. Uh, because I like to kind of go through how these churches began so that you kind of understand why he's writing this letter and what kind of community he's writing it to so you know their background. Um, and we find the, finding, the founding of this church in Acts, Acts 16. And in Acts 16, we see you know, Paul, he's on his second missionary journey. He's traveling through Asia Minor. Um, and his initial plan was to head north, to share the gospel to the northern areas. But... Because of the leading of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit actually stopped him from going to the north. And it leads him on a different path. And so at night, um, when he's in Troas, he has this dream. He has this dream about a man in Macedonia. This man is asking for help. And so Paul, the next day, after receiving guidance from this dream, from this vision, um, he and his team, they head out. And they sail to the west, across the sea, um, to Macedonia. And he's guided there, and after landing, um, they travel a little bit inland, and they end up at the city of Philippi. So what kind of city was Philippi? Philippi, it was a remote colony of Rome. There's many Roman soldiers, actually. Many Roman soldiers did actually retire and move to this city. So you could kind of think of it as a retirement community of Roman soldiers and their families. Uh, but since it was a Roman colony, that means it was still a part of Rome. That means all of the governing laws, all of the rights, the culture, all these things were exactly the same as Rome. And for me, I was thinking about this, and I was thinking, it's kind of like, you know, when I, I go on the army base as Judah ministry. And every once in a while, I go on an army base, and, you know, going from Korea to inside the army base, it's like being in America. <laughs> Everything is American. All the laws that you follow are American. You know, the currency, the money you use, it's U.S. dollars. Um, you know, everyone speaks English. They're all from America. All the food is American. The TV, the radio, everything is America. So it's like mini USA in Korea, right? Um, and Philippi is kind of like that. You know, it's not in Rome. It's outside of Rome. It's a little, it's outside, definitely far um, from Rome. But it is like mini Rome, everything about it. And the Philippians, they actually prided themselves on this fact. They spoke the Roman language, which is Latin. Their fashion and trends were that of Rome. Their culture, even their religion, it was Roman. It was mini-Rome in Macedonia. And that's why also um, Paul, he didn't go into a synagogue um, to start preaching the news. That was his normal custom. Whenever he entered a city, he'd go to a synagogue. But he didn't do that in this case because... There was no synagogue. Um, there actually weren't that many Jews in Philippi. And when he enters the city, what he does is he basically goes in and one Saturday, um, he goes to pray near a stream. 
And there he meets with Lydia. And Lydia is a businesswoman. And she's Roman, uh, but she's a bit special in that she's Roman, but she does read the scriptures. She does know about the true God. And so Paul shares the gospel with her. She becomes a believer, and her entire family is saved. And then later we see Paul, he has this incident with a fortune teller and the fortune teller's owners. And after a spirit is cast out of the fortune teller, you know, this crowd is riled up by the owners and they, you know, they want to imprison Paul. And so what they do, their actual accusation against Paul is this. It says, these men are Jews. These men are Jews and they're throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for our Romans to accept or practice. Right? So what is the reason why Paul is thrown in prison? It's because he's charged with teaching something that goes against Roman culture. Right? Because this city is very Roman. And so Paul and Silas are thrown in prison. And while in prison, the amazing thing is they begin singing praise. You know, they're beaten, they're thrown in prison, they're in their inner cell, shackled up. And they begin singing hymns and praise to God. And while they're doing so, there's a miracle. There's an earthquake. Their shackles come off, the doors are opened. And now Paul and Silas could have easily escaped, but more important than their freedom was to share the gospel to the jailer, who was about to commit suicide because of what had happened. And so in Acts 16.34 it says, The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God. He and his whole household. And so right here we see, through this situation, this jailer saved. He's filled with joy and his whole household is saved. We see the next day, Paul and Silas, since they are actually Roman citizens, this news is found out, and thus they are freed. And they come out, and they go to Lydia's house, and they actually encourage the believers that are there before leaving. So the start of the Church of Philippi, and the center that we're going to look at, is basically started off of these two families. Now we have Lydia's family, they became saved, and the jailer's family. This is the start of the church there. So Paul, he has a purpose in writing this letter to this church. It's addressed to all the saints of Christ Jesus of Philippi, together with the overseers and the deacons. So we see this church is somewhat established. There's already deacons there, there's elders there. Um, they're doing pretty well. And he writes this letter uh, because this church is very generous. They have a lot of support for Paul. So one of the main reasons he's writing this letter is simply as a thank you note. It's to thank them for their support, especially financially, but also one of their church members actually goes all the way to Rome to assist Paul and help him. So he thanks them for sending one of their members. And he also writes um, an introduction for Timothy. And Timothy is the one that he's sending to that church to be its minister. And so he writes an introduction letter for Timothy before he begins his ministry there. But the main focus of this letter, and this is what we're going to look at today, um, is this letter, it's really to encourage them. To encourage them to stand firm in the face of persecution, regardless of their situation. And he also speaks about the work of the Holy Spirit in sanctifying them. And then he ends by really pointing out the value of Christ. How it's incomparable, incomparable to anything else um, this world has to offer. So the first point I want to look at is called praise and persecution. Um, praise and persecution. And so just like I said, remember, you know, when Paul was first in Philippi, um, Paul and Silas, while they were in prison, what were they doing? They were praising God. They were singing hymns, praising in their persecution, which is kind of unbelievable to me. Uh, but that's what they were doing. But now, the Church of Philippi, they're kind of facing the same situation. Um, the believers in Philippi, they're sharing in this persecution for the beliefs that they have. Because this faith in Christ, it goes against Roman culture. You know, it was the same reason Paul was thrown in prison. Right? It was against the customs. 
what they are doing is they have this faith that goes against the mainstream faith of the time, which is towards the Roman gods and goddesses. And I want us to remember this kind of as we go through this letter. Um, because as Christians, you know, we don't have beliefs that are mainstream, that follow along with the rest of the world. Um, and at times, Christians do face persecution, just like this church was doing. Um, you know, physical persecution maybe doesn't happen here, uh, where Christianity is more open, but in places like China, in places like North Korea, in places like, you know, the Middle East, there is physical persecution they're facing. But that doesn't mean we don't face any persecution at all, right? I mean, as Christians, what is the type of persecution we face? It's not physical persecution necessarily, but it's more of the way people look at us. Maybe as an outcast to society, uh, an outcast to our peers, because we're not necessarily following the flow of this world. Right? Everyone says you've got to be open, accept everything. You know, you know, there are Buddhists, there are Muslim. You know, accept religions. We have to be okay with this, right? Which we should. We should be loving and caring, um, but not to the point where everyone has the same truth, because truth is exclusive. So we do face persecution at times, not physically, but from our society. And, you know, the church in Philippi, they're facing persecution. So Paul writes to them to encourage them. You know, in the midst of what they're facing, he encourages them to stand firm in faith. And he points to his own situation as a prisoner in Rome to do that. How being a prisoner in Rome and this persecution that he's facing, how it's actually a blessing he says in Philippians 1.12, he says, Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Now Paul sees his imprisonment as a blessing. It's a part of God's plan. And he believes it's actually a way to enhance the proclamation of the gospel. How is that possible? He says in verse 13, As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else, that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. So you see, two things came about through this imprisonment. Right? The first thing, all the guards have the opportunity to hear the gospel. That's an amazing thing. And secondly, the believers of the church, the believers in the regions, the believers throughout the world, they're encouraged to be courageous as well in the proclamation of the gospel. So I think that when Paul, when he entered into this prison in Rome, I think he was reminded kind of of his experience in Philippi when he was in prison. Um, in Philippi, it's like a mini Rome, right? <laughs> so it's kind of similar. Uh, but how he was in prison... And how through that situation, an entire, an entire family became saved. Right? How that jailer's family became saved. And I think that Paul, he sees that after his experiences, it seems like God works many times through these quote-unquote problems that we have. It seems that through these problems, it seems to be the best way that the gospel is being proclaimed. That God is truly working. And I see that Paul, he really has his heart set on the right things. He has a sense of his commission, living his life, not for these worldly things, but for the kingdom of God. We see in Philippians 1.21, he says this, he says, For me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. In the face of persecution, in the face of death itself, he's not worried, he's not afraid. He actually says, you know, to live is Christ, to die is gain. I mean, what does he mean by that? In verse 22, If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is by far, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Now, basically, where was Paul's heart at? Paul desired to be with Christ. He didn't fear death because he saw death as the time to be reunited with his Savior. 
But he also recognized God had work for him to do. And until he was called by God, he would do the work that was needed in bringing those around him into the same blessing that he has. This work was necessary. However, to Paul, to dwell in Christ was greater than anything else this world had to offer. And I think this is something that is very important for us to grasp and understand. Um, because we have so many things tied up in this world. Basically, our castles made of sand. We fill our wood and concrete homes with things, more and more things to entertain us, uh, to make us feel comfortable. You know, it's really hard to live for the kingdom of God when we're really living more for this kingdom, right? And the problem is, the more we have, the more we kind of root down, and the harder it is to let go. I remember when I first came to Korea, I came to Korea, and I had a little bit of savings um, from working as an engineer, but that kind of went down to zero <laughs> after a while. Um, and kind of during the time I was in the mission home too, um, I gave away all my belongings that I had in America, because I couldn't leave them in storage for too long, it was too expensive. And so basically, when I was here in Korea, you know, the first few years, I had nothing. And I had no money, um, no belongings, just what I brought with me in my suitcase. Um, and during that time, my view of a lot of things changed. My view regarding money, my view regarding things, it all changed. Because I realized, you don't need money to be happy. You don't need all these things that we surround ourselves to be happy and to be content. It's kind of an illusion. And I realized that, you know, if, if you know, there was a fire and everything that I owned, you know, burned, or if it was all stolen, you know, I had no worries, no qualms about it. It was okay. If I lost everything, it was okay. I didn't have that much to lose. You know, I was so at peace regarding things. For me, during that time, it was a time where I could really just focus on, you know, my spiritual state, on my training, and the relationships around me. And that was truly a blessed time. But now the problem came. The longer I lived in Korea, I've been here over 11 years now, and during the first few years when I had nothing because I never knew when I was going to go back, I was okay. But the longer I was here, the more I started buying stuff, <laughs> the more I started rooting down. And now, you know, after possessing and collecting a lot of things, now I have responsibilities. Um, and now, because of that, because I'm so rooted now, it's hard to let go of those things, right? Um, and I tend to worry more about my status and the conditions of things. And that's why, you know, these words are important. These words that Paul had to remind us. You know, what did he say? To live is Christ and to die is gain. Now this is something, this is someone, I mean, that, that really discovered the mystery of life. Really to live for the eternal. To live for Christ and the kingdom of God and just to guide others around you to that same eternal life while we have the time, while we're here on this earth. Because when our time's up, when God calls us, it's not something that we have to be afraid of. It's simply our time to go home. You know, a time when all the pain, all the suffering, all the tears, all the hardship, it's all finished. All that remains is that joy of being with Christ in heaven. That is the blessing, that's the mystery that Paul discovered that we too need to discover. The second point that I want to look at today, it's not one that's explicit, but Paul refers to it in a lot of ways. Um, he refers to the process of sanctification um, that we're all undergoing. And Paul stresses this process um, because he wants the believers of Philippi to kind of come to the same point that he has come to, where Christ is of greatest value. So the second point is the process of change or sanctification. Now, if you don't know, sanctification is a process that we're all undergoing as Christians. It's the process of being made holy or being made righteous into the likeness of Christ. And this can confuse a lot of people because a lot of people think that, that they are in a process of being saved. And so it's possible to lose their salvation along the way. That's not true. That's not the way. You are justified or saved. Your soul is saved the moment you believe. The moment that you are born again of the Holy Spirit. The sanctification is a process where the Holy Spirit, it's changing your imprints. It's changing your nature to have that of Christ. Your salvation is guaranteed. It's your nature 
that is changing. And so Paul, he prays for the same blessing for them. In chapter 1, verse 4, he says, In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And especially this verse. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Justification for our sins was the start. God began this work in us. The moment the Holy Spirit came to dwell in you, the moment you were born again. And the Holy Spirit, it continues to work in you even today. It continues bringing your nature to completion in Christ. That is the process that he's talking about. He's confident. He says, be confident of this. God is going to do it. He began a good work in you. He's going to carry it on to completion. And he talks to them about having one heart or one spirit and purpose. In chapter 2, verse 1, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from this love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Right? Paul's desire for them was to have that same love, to have that humility of Christ. And he points actually to the Gospel as a perfect example of this. And he's encouraging them to be one in spirit and to live for the same purpose, which is to be a witness of Christ. And so following that, we see the gospel. We see the gospel that is in within this letter to the Philippians. In chapter 2, verse 5, it says, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And then Philippians 2, verses 6 to 11. If you look there, it says, He, I, who... Being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in the appearance as a man, be hum he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, and at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. This is the gospel, right? This is actually kind of in a hymn format. This might have been something that they sang as a praise. And we see here the King of kings, the Lord of lords, our God. He humbled himself. Humbled himself to becoming man and not just you know a man that was in a high status like a king or prince he humbled himself to being in the lowest form he was a servant he humbled himself to being obedient to the cross to die in our place to die and face the wrath that God had for our sins so that we can be saved and that is why we praise him that is why we glorify his name that is how much he loved us. And now I want to look at another passage. And this passage that we're going to look at now, it can be very confusing to a lot of people. It's in chapter 2, verse 12. Chapter 2, verse 12, if you look at it, it says, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Continue to work out your salvation. You know, if I just ended there, what would be your thoughts? Right? If someone just met you on the street, and maybe they were evangelizing to you, and they pointed to this verse, you know, how would you respond? You know, this is one of the reasons I stress the importance of reading the Bible and getting to know God's Word. Because if you didn't read the rest of Paul's letter, what would you think after reading this? This passage would you, lead you to believe, hey, we are saved by works. It's very clear. It's right here in this passage. Work out your salvation. You've got to work. You've got to put in the effort. You have to do something. You've got to be perfect. You've got to be righteous. It's pretty clear here. Work out your salvation. You've got to do the work with fear of God because you're a sinner, right? This is why context and knowing the author is so important. 
for this exact reason. Anyone can take this verse and use it to convince other people that their salvation is based on works. You know, I've met a lot of people and have had conversations and arguments with people regarding legalism, and this is the verse they point to a lot of times to kind of, you know, so they can continue in their legalistic ways. They're like, look, it says right here, right? But what's the truth? We know from Paul's other letters, he cannot mean to earn your salvation by works. We know this, you know? Because of his other letters, he's extremely clear. We are not saved by works, we're saved by God's grace. If you look at Galatians, the entire letter of Galatians is all about this. Romans is all about this. Ephesians is all about this. All of his letters, he's always talking about, it's not by works, it's always by grace. He emphasizes works do not save us. And he emphasizes grace so much, he actually gets accused of preaching lawlessness. You know, he preaches, oh, you know, we don't, you're not under the law, you're under grace, so do whatever you want. A lot of people think that he's actually encouraging sin. We saw that in some of his letters. That is how much he preaches. It's not about works, it's about grace. So if it's not about working to be saved, what is he talking about here? What he basically means for us is for us to kind of seek spiritual growth and development with respect to who God is. And what I mean is, you know, our salvation is by grace. It's by faith. It's a gift. But this gift, it's kind of the start of this change for us, a new life. And he's talking about sanctification here again. This process that we're undergoing, this process of being made complete and holy in Christ. You know, the quote-unquote work that we're doing is simply faith. We have faith. We apply the word to our lives. You know, through service, we serve the church, we serve others. This is how we grow. This is how we mature. (coughs) And really, to help you understand what this verse means, you have to read it in context. What does the next verse say? Verse 13. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Right? So what's the answer there? I think it's pretty clear. Who does the work? It's God. God wills you. He leads you. He does the work. Right? He makes you alive in Christ. He chose you before the creation of the earth to be holy and blameless in his sight. Of course, we do have free will, right? You know, as Christians, we've been saved, we're born again, we have free will. We have the choice to spend time with God or to spend time following the flow of this world. Right? Every day you make that choice. When we spend time in God's Word, when we spend time in prayer, you know, the Word and prayer, these are things that kind of, even worship, these are things that kind of fuels the Holy Spirit. Right? It's kind of like, you know, putting gas in a car. We fuel that Holy Spirit and it changes us. You know, that's our role, to kind of add to that feeling through our faith, through our application of the Word, through hearing the Word, through prayer. You know, God works, though, regardless of what we do. But there is an aid. That is what I'm talking about. We can aid the Spirit's work when we align our lives with God's purpose. It's our choice. You know, when you wake up in the morning, you can choose just to go out your day, or you can spend time, you know, looking at God's Word spending a minute or two in prayer. That's the difference. And for Paul, <coughs> you know, Paul's really made his commitment for living for the kingdom of God. And his life, you know, is it's not for himself. It's to be lived to serve others. And so he says that he's going to really sacrifice himself so others can know this joy that he has. In chapter 2, verse 17, it says, But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. You know, and Paul's honest. You know, he is going through this process. He's okay with going through hardship. He's okay with, like we went through, being in prison. He even sees that as a blessing to enhance the gospel. I mean, this is someone that really has their spiritual eyes open and knows what life is really about. And that's why the third point today is about knowing the value of Christ. Chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, 
and it is a safeguard for you. Why is it a safeguard for them? In verse 2 he says, Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. It sounds kind of bad, right? Those mutilators of the flesh. <laughs> what is he talking about? In verse 3, in context, right? For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his Spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. And so he's talking about the circumcision here, right? These mutilators of the flesh that he's talking about, he's referring to these Judaizers. Judaizers were people that would bring the law into the church and say, you've got to be circumcised, you've got to keep the festivals, you've got to keep, you know, the laws. Right? It's the same thing that happened to the church, the Galatian church. Right? Judaizers came into the Galatian church and he's writing to them to say, you're not under the law, you know, you're under grace. But these people, they're coming in, these mutilators of the flesh, they're turning people back to the laws of Judaism. And I think this is very interesting, because remember the city that it's in, Philippi. This is a Roman city. And so what are these Jews doing? They're kind of taking advantage of Christianity as a door to bring in Judaism into this group, into this region, right? And so Paul, he confronts those being swayed by these Judaizers, by these legalists, by using his own background. In chapter 3, verse 4, he says, If anyone thinks he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcision on the eighth day of the people of Israel, tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews, regarding the law of Pharisee, regarding zeal, a persecutor of the church, <clears throat> regarding legalistic righteousness, Faultless. <coughs> Basically, Paul is saying that compared to these Jews that are trying to convert them, he knows better. I mean, his life was pursuing this. You know, he is a true Jew in both identity and knowledge and experience in his passion. I mean, a persecutor of the church in his legalism, it says he was faultless. Basically, he's saying, I was sinless. Right? That's the way he regarded himself at the time. You know, he's basically at the top of the class regarding pursuit of life through this means, through the law. Because their argument was, to be confident in your salvation, you have to cover every angle, including the law. So even if they say they're a Christian, okay, you know, you say you're saved, but maybe not. You better follow the law, just to be sure. And Paul says, No. Paul says that he gave up his entire life to pursue such a path. And how does he view that now? What does he think of it? In chapter 3, verse 7, But whatever was my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. That pursuit was worthless. In verse 8, What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. He considers his past life of pursuing righteousness, self-righteousness, a complete loss. If anything, that pursuit through the law, it actually deterred him from seeking the truth. Because if he had seen himself as a sinner, then he might have welcomed the message of Christ right from the start, right? But no, because of his self-righteousness, because of his pride, because of his stubbornness, he worked against the gospel, a persecutor of the church, a persecutor of believers. And these are the people that now he calls brothers and sisters, that he's living amongst. It was a total loss. Not only that, he considers all the world has to offer. Everything the world has to offer is a loss compared to knowing Christ. People treasure the things of this world, but that is rubbish, he says. That is trash compared to the eternal blessing found in Christ. And this is what we have to live for. This treasure that's found only in Christ. So what does he say? You know, 
he shares that he too, he's not perfect yet, but he's on the same path as us. We're all a work under progress. None of us are perfect. We're all on this process of sanctification. Chapter 3, verse 12, he says, Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Amen. Right? This connects with chapter 1, verse 6, when it said, Be confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on until completion, until the day of Christ Jesus. He's repeating this idea of sanctification. And he's saying, you know, be confident of this for you guys. But he's also saying, hey, I'm in the same situation. And you guys are all looking to me. You know, I'm not perfect either. I'm in the same process. I'm heading on that same path, setting my focus on Christ. And he encourages them to do the same. In verse 13, brothers, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And he knows he's not perfect, but he's not going to let his past be a shackle to him. He's not going to let the guilt of his past or the lost way that he was on for so long be something that deters him. He's going to go forward. He's a new creation in Christ. It's a new day, a new life in Christ. So he just strains forward towards the kingdom of God. So he sets the focus and priority of his life. And as he does that, he gains peace and contentment. In chapter 4, verse 11, says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through Him who gives me strength. Right, that last verse is very popular. I can do all things through Him who gives me strength. Yeah. You know, this is something that we all strive for, right? You know, happiness, it actually comes and goes. But what is it to be content in every situation? <clears throat> Paul reveals that this secret, he's found it. To be content in plenty or in want. No matter what his situation, he says, that secret is found in God. That secret is found when you're truly satisfied in Christ alone. When that is where your true satisfaction comes from, you don't need satisfaction from this world. That is his point. Whether plenty or in want, it's okay. He's content because he has Christ. In conclusion, and like I said at the beginning, Philippines, it's known as this letter of joy. But we see this true joy, where does it come from? It comes from being in Christ. So whether it's persecution or problems, God has a plan, Amen. if your eyes are open to see it, Amen. as Paul's eyes were. So whatever your past, whatever your future, know that God will be with you, working in you, sanctifying you day by day. And as he transforms your heart and mind, you're going to come to know the mystery that Paul had. The mystery where he was able to confess this, that to live is Christ and to die is gain. That all is rubbish compared to knowing Christ. And the secret of contentment, no matter the situation, is to be truly satisfied in Christ alone. This is the strength that comes from God. So I want to close by kind of bringing our focus back in our lives to more of the eternal things. Because for Paul, he lived for the kingdom of God and he knew that was his true home. Not this earth, but his true home was in heaven. So in chapter 3, verse 18, it says, For as I have told you, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is their shame. Their mind is is on earthly things. You know, we live in the real world where greed, selfishness, recognition are things that people strive for. 
You know, it says their God is their stomach. Basically, they just crave more and more and more materialism to gain things. Their glory is their shame. It's about the recognition. They want to receive it. They want to receive the praise. These are things that people strive for. But what must we remember? What is our true home? Chapter 3, verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await our Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like His glorious body. Right? This is pointing to Christ's return, that day of justice, our day of resurrection and glorification. And he's talking about, you know, this last part, we're talking about that sanctification. We're being brought to completion. And the last part is glorification, or to have that body, that resurrected body that Christ too had. But he's pointing to our true home, it's in heaven. Right? So how should we live our lives? As citizens of heaven. And finally, you know, what is our application of daily life that Paul is writing about here for attaining this mystery of life? Philippians 4, verse 4. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding. We got your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And Paul says, Rejoice! And he repeats again. Again, I say rejoice, right? How many of you guys live your life like that? Rejoice. You know, sometimes when I get really tired and I have to do something very difficult, I just pray, Lord, give me, give me the joy of the Lord in my heart <laughs> before I face this, right? And it gives me strength. Know that the Lord is near. The Lord is near than you think. Because right? God is with you. He's in you. It's called Emmanuel. And when you face a situation, he says, don't worry, don't be anxious, but take all these things into prayer and let the peace of God guard your heart. And trust your worries to God. He is sovereign, he's in control. And allow that peace that transcends all understanding to guard you, to guard especially your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Why? Because Satan's going to attack you there. When you face a worry, when you face, when you have anxiety, that's when Satan attacks and he wears you down. We need to take those things into prayer to God. So I pray that this week, that you will live a life of joy that comes from being truly satisfied in Christ alone. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.